So DaVinci Resolve 17 has been out for quite a few weeks now, but I really wanted to take the time to test out the newest feature that I am the most excited about. And between that testing and my laptop basically breaking on me, when I mean breaking, my Razer laptop's charger port completely fried from the motherboard. I was told I was lucky the laptop did not catch on fire and Razer's customer support is not necessarily the best. So I had to have a friend fix it for me, which took some time. So I am sorry for the delay in this video, but with that being said, today we are going to be talking about the HDR color primaries in DaVinci Resolve, the most powerful tool in this update and what I believe is going to change the game for a lot of colorists out there. I'm even going back and regrading some projects that I had finished but had not sent out yet. So without further ado, let's get right into the video, but first, a word from our sponsor. Myself, SBG's Elite Colorist is a live interactive color grading course designed to take you through an A to Z curriculum in DaVinci Resolve. And yes, it has been updated for DaVinci Resolve 17. Gone are the days of downloading a pre-recorded one-size-fits-all course. You will meet with me in person, online of course, twice a week for a whole month, where you will be able to ask questions as I go through examples, work on examples by taking over my screen, and so much more. A link is in the description down below with the full details. <laughs> So for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with the HDR color wheels, it's pretty simple. They are like log wheels, but for each individual tonal range. In the log wheels, you were able to set the high range and the low range of the controls, and then color grade each of those tonal ranges from there, the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. However, with the HDR primary wheels, we're able to take that a step further for a total of six tonal ranges. We have our blacks, our darks, our shadows, our lights, our highlights, and our specular highlights. And yes, we can tell DaVinci Resolve exactly where we want each of those tonal ranges to lie. And the best part is, is that we're able to do it with a visual highlight reference. So gone are the days of guessing where is my low range and where is my high range. The most crucial part of this is going to be the setup. We are going to be using a DaVinci Resolve color managed workflow. To do this, we're going to go into our project settings and we are going to select color management. From there in the color management tab, we're going to take DaVinci YRGB as the color space and change it into the color managed option. Now you will notice there, it will say SDR Rec 709 underneath that. What we're going to do there is we are going to change that to the DaVinci wide gamut. And where we see that it's going to say Rec 709 2.4 as our output color space. Well, basically we can keep that there, which will work for most things such as uploading to YouTube. However, if your client wants something in sRGB or a different color space, that's where you will apply that there. This is a crucial step because SDR, or Standard Dynamic Range, Rec. 709, is confined to only 100 nits. When we would work with our footage, we will notice that not all of the controls would work right. Things like the specular highlights may not show up, so on and so forth, and we're just not taking advantage of all of that dynamic range. In fewer words or less to simplify this, we are taking our footage and putting it into a high dynamic range color space, or a wider color space, and then bringing it back into standard dynamic range, keeping us legally within Rec. 709, but also giving us that high dynamic range image. From here, three scenarios are going to pop up. If you are shooting RAW, DaVinci Resolve is automatically going to put this footage into Rec. 709 for you. However, if you did not shoot RAW, then we're going to have to tell DaVinci Resolve what color space we worked with. We do this by left-clicking on the clip, we then select input color space, and we choose from the wide array of color spaces from all the major camera manufacturers. This leads us to our third scenario. If we are using a camera that is not supported by Blackmagic because they would much rather cripple their NLE because they're afraid of the competition of cameras like Zcam, Kinefinity, anything that shoots ProRes RAW, instead of simply creating better cameras, then we're going to have to use a Rec. 709 LUT. So in this example, I am using a Zcam clip 
shot in Zlog2, and I'm simply going to apply the Zlog2 Rec709 LUT. But I'm not going to do that on my nodes. I'm going to do that again by left clicking on the clip, going to the LUT section, and then selecting my LUT from there. After we have told DaVinci Resolve what color space we are in, we are now able to see that our specular highlights show up, as well as the blacks in every single tonal range in our image, and that is what we want. We want to see all of those ranges so we can pull out as much information from them as possible. From here, we can then open up the side panel and start to adjust where each one of these specific tonal ranges will lie. The key with this is to remember that there are two specific tonal ranges that will affect all the other tonal ranges on the corresponding side. The shadows will affect the shadows, the darks, and the blacks of the image, while the darks will only affect the darks and the blacks, and the blacks will only affect the blacks. Similarly, the lights will affect the lights the highlights and specular highlights of the image, while the highlights will only affect the highlights and specular highlights, and the specular highlights will only affect the specular highlights. With time, all of what I just said will become more secondhand, but my work smarter, not harder method is to simply start with the shadows, and then we can go in and adjust each of those ranges. Again, we wanna start with those shadows because it's easier for us to put the shadows down, and then if it's too dark in the dark areas or the black areas, we can raise them up. But if we start it by making those dark and then making our shadows dark, then we're just creating a mess and going all over the place. So let's work on a real world example and see how this works in practice. I have this clip from a commercial that I shot for a product, and we can see that with the Rec. 709 LUT, it's not really an HDR look. Our highlights are completely blown out. So the first thing I always like to do is fix the darker areas of my image first. By bringing down the shadows first, I can get a really nice starting point, and then I can make adjustments on the bottom portion of the exposure later if that very bottom portion gets too dark. If I would have started with the blacks and adjusted that so it starts affecting something, and then I went with the darks and the shadows, I would probably have to go back after I messed with the shadows to the darks to make the exposure look nicer. So by starting with the shadows, we are keeping it more efficient. So as you can see with this example, we set the shadows to a point where we like them for the look that we're going with in our mind, and we're making our best aim when looking at our waveform not to clip information, and that's the point we're really gonna work with our scopes here. Again, all of these adjustments are to our personal preference. And one of the things I like to stress to all of my students is simply grade till the image looks good. There is no right or wrong way unless the image just doesn't tell the story. And the story here that we're going for is an HDR look. That's why we shot in this location and that's why we shot against the sun to really just show off what the camera can do, at least from the DP standpoint. That's my little secret trick. Let's continue. When we made those adjustments in the shadows, we will notice that the saturation of the image changed a bit. That's because these tools do not work like our traditional primaries. So I'm going to go to the saturation section of the shadows and add in a bit more saturation to the shadows to make it look natural again. This is true for all of the HDR tools. The contrast does not add saturation the same way that the contrast and the regular primaries do. So be mindful of this as we're making those adjustments. If your skin tones or parts of your image start to look weird, but the tonal range is right, it's most likely the saturation that has changed, so we can add that there as needed. So after we've added our saturation into the areas that change, we are then going to work with the brighter portions of our image, but with a twist from the same way that we worked with our shadows. I am going to start with my lights because that's where my skin tones lie, but then I'm going to go all the way to the end and work with my specular highlights because the majority of the time I find that I tend to overexpose to get that bottom information. So let's bring back that information in post. So looking at this image, I'm going to set the lights to my liking, and then this is where the magic happens. I'm going to bring down the specular highlights to bring back all of that information. And as we can see, this is a completely different look than what we started with with our Rec. 709 LUT. I am also then going to bring down the highlights to really seal the deal of this image. Again, all of these adjustments are made to personal preference. That is why. I love this tool. That was a really big change, and that would have taken me forever using the HDR mode with the color primaries or HDR mode with the curves tool to try to get that same effect and get it to look as natural as that. But let's go ahead and take this grade a step further 
and rock out our skin tones. A little bonus in the tutorial. To finalize this look, we are going to go ahead and qualify out our skin tones. After we make our initial qualification, be sure to manually adjust the hue in case some things are getting picked up by DaVinci Resolve that should not be picked up. Try to get it as close as possible and then at the very end, go ahead and add a little bit of low soft in the saturation to really isolate those skin tones. When using the HDR primaries to color correct our skin tones, we have the power to affect specific tonal ranges of the skin by looking at the highlights of where each one lies and then making those corrections from there. So for example, I can affect just the highlights of the skin or the lighter areas of the skin if, for example, I had a weird color cast going on there. That is not the case in this example, but we can see the power that this tool has and we can do the same things if we have a color cast in the shadows. This tends to be more pronounced with black skin Color casts tend to affect darker areas more. So if you are working with blacker skin tones, this is an awesome feature and my students have been loving it. And that is the basis to using the HDR color primaries in DaVinci Resolve. From there, we would continue to set up our layer and create our look as I've taught you in other tutorials. I hope you guys like this video as much as I have enjoyed creating it. If you would like more in-depth color grading education outside of all of the free education on the channel, be sure to check out my color grading course. A link is in the description down below. Be sure to hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and turn on my post notifications if you have not, be sure to follow me on my social media. A link is in the description down below, as well as the YouTube fam. A link to their channel is also in the description down below. Welcome back, Dr. D. If you guys are ever feeling uninspired, uncreative, or just want to give up on life, remember, every day, airplanes take off against the wind. Keep climbing, stay inspired, and as always, stay fabulous. My name is Sydney, and I will see you guys next time. Peace out.